about God from observing the way he treats other people, other nations perhaps. So we must handle God's word correctly to understand it and use it for our benefit. As I said, look at James, chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Greetings. James is a very early book. If you look at James, there's no mention of Gentiles or nations. Some people think James is the first New Testament document written. Mark may be the first gospel, but they think James is the first New Testament document, written possibly even earlier than when Peter went to Cornelius. There is nothing about Gentiles in it. It's talking about Jews being mistreated, suffering at the hands of other Jews. It's not talking about them suffering at the hands of the Romans or the Gentiles. It's talking about Jews being mistreated by other Jews by those more powerful Jews, those more affluent Jews. This is exactly what happened to many of those Jewish Christians in their early days. We can see it with Paul, and Paul wasn't the exception in the way he was mistreated. Many Christian Jews were mistreated. Peter says to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout the Roman Empire, where else it is, right? Again, the technical term for dispersion. That's who Peter's writing to. That's who Peter is writing to. But we can learn from much of Peter. He says, you know, be ready to give um, an explanation for the hope that you have. Yeah, we should be ready to give an explanation to other people for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. This is an interesting one. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This is one of Paul's letters. Now, Paul's letters sometimes are a bit tricky to understand. Paul's letters are a bit tricky to understand because some parts of them deal with the problems which are peculiar to Jewish Christians. Some of them deal with problems that are peculiar to Gentile Christians and some common to both. Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says there in verse 1, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. <clears throat> so it's pretty obvious now that he's addressing the Jewish Christians. That's pretty obvious. Now if you go on to chapter 12, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, he says in verse 1, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Well, he's not talking to Jews now. Right? He's now talking to Gentiles. And he's dealing with problems of the Gentile community. So, so sometimes when you go through, if you, if, you watch, if you watch carefully, you can pick out what's going on. If he's dealing, as he does in other parts of Corinthians, with extreme sexual immorality in certain parts of the church, which part of the church had extreme sexual immorality? The Gentiles, not the Jewish part of the church. If, if he's talking about the law in the context, who's he dealing with? The Jewish Christians, because he's dealing with the law of Moses. So sometimes you can pick up these signals as you go through and think, ah, he's dealing with that. So that must be some sort of problem with the Gentile community, or that must be some sort of problem with the Jewish community. And tomorrow morning, I think, um, in the Bible study, I'm going to deal with one of these very peculiar problems that were peculiar to the Church of Rome and the Gentile Christians in the Church of Rome had a very difficult particular peculiar problem Paul had to deal with. When it comes to the Ephesians, the writer just says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. I'm writing to you Gentiles. I'm writing to you nations now. This is who my writing to. I mean, we read later on in Ephesians, there's no Jew, there's no Gentile. And we'll look at that a little bit later. So bear in mind that these letters, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, 1, 2, 3 John, Jude, a Revelation, they're written to Christian Jews during the time covered by the Acts of the Apostles. There are things we can learn from them. Uh, there are passages, parts of them we can apply to ourselves. But if we try and take the whole lot on board, then we're going to run into trouble. We're going to run into big trouble. <clears throat> Paul's letters... Galatians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Romans. Okay? Now, 
Note Romans 1.16. We've already read it. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Now, some parts of Romans are very good. It makes it very clear that we are saved by grace through faith. It makes it very clear there's none righteous, no, not one. That's what he makes it very clear about. So, yes, we can apply those parts of Romans to ourselves. But this part of Romans, to first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, well, that doesn't apply to us. We can't apply that bit to us. We don't have to go to the Jew first. Similarly, as we mentioned in the last session, there'll be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And why? Why does the Jew have this special place due in the book of Acts? Well, there's one of the reasons. I mentioned earlier that all the Christian leaders during the book of the Acts, all the evangelism, all the teaching was actually done by the Jews. Why? Well, what does he say? What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. They had the scriptures. When some of these Gentile pagans got saved in Corinth, what did they know? When some of those philosophers on Mars Hill believed, what did they know about the God of Israel? Not very much. They could hardly then change over instantly from being lecturers in Greek philosophy to teachers about Jesus Christ. They couldn't do it. They had the advantage. The Jew had the advantage. Now, think about this. Oops, let's go back. Is that true today? What advantage is there in being a Jew today? Or what value is there in circumcision today? You can't say much in every way because they haven't got the very words of God. Not today they haven't. Our Jewish brothers today have the Old Testament, but they don't have the New Testament. So they are now at a disadvantage. It's a disadvantage for, for them being a Jew today. And quite often also, and we might find this rather strange, because we don't do the very much of this. Basically, in our Christian services, in our Sunday and our Bible studies, we tend to teach positive Christianity. We try to explain what the Bible teaches, and we try to encourage good living, we try and try to encourage deeper faith. We don't spend a lot of time criticizing other religions. We may do occasionally, and I'm going to do it here now, because in many, in many synagogues, they will teach people against what the New Testament says. They will actually teach them against the New Testament. Jesus Christ was not this because of this, 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 and this. And they'll conjure up a whole case pointing out that Jesus didn't fulfill the Old Testament references. So therefore, a Jew today is a big disadvantage. It's the same, it's the same with the mosques. They will also teach against Christianity. You know, we don't do this. We don't teach against Islam. We may disagree with it, and occasionally we may... We may spend some time studying it and discussing it, but it's the odd occasion rather than a regular feature. So the Jew now today is at a great disadvantage, a great disadvantage. So that's Paul's letters during the Acts period. For the ones that come afterwards, we have Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, 1 Timothy, Titus, and then his last letter is 2 Timothy. Those are Paul's letters written after that point in time. And so, really, you have three divisions of the New Testament. You have the Gospel period, right? And that's obviously covered by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the Gospel period, as we saw this morning, is almost exclusively Jewish. It's almost exclusively to the Jews. Apart from the Syrophoenician or Canaanite woman, and apart from a centurion in Capernaum, the Lord really didn't have any significant dealings with any other Gentile other than Pontius Pilate. You then got the period of time called the Acts of the Apostles. And there is so much activity going on in that period of time. And this is the area over which most Christians disagree with one another. What actually pertains from the Acts of the Apostles and what's true for today? Now, that's not an easy question to answer for many people. The first of all, we have to recognize that you've got the Acts of the Apostles and you've got those letters written during that period of time. We also have to recognize that during that period of time, well, the first part of the book of Acts is totally exclusively Jewish. 
In the second part of the book of Acts, you've got the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So the Jew is in the dominant position. We've got all those Jewish letters, letters to Jewish Christians, as we said, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, 1, 2, 3 John, Jude and Revelation. And then you've got Paul's letters, which are, which are also addressed to Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. Because in the churches that he formed at that point in time, and the ones he didn't form, the one like Romans he didn't form, in the Roman church, in the Corinthian church, in the Galatian churches, and in the Thessalonican churches, there are mixtures of Jews and Gentiles. And then you've got the third division, the later letters of Paul, all believers now are equal. There's no such thing as a Jewish Christian or a Gentile Christian. In God's eyes, there's no such thing as an American Christian and a British Christian. There's just Christians. And the only division that exists nowadays is either you're a believer in Christ or you're not. And that is it. Simple as that. Now, you've got a handout. Let's have a look at this handout. If you can have a look at this handout here now. <clears throat> this handout is an extension of that chart that's up on the screen there. <clears throat> what I just want you to do, this is your homework. You can take this away and play with it. You can add to it. You can look it up. Think of the big three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Think how significant those were. If you look at the number of references in the gospel to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you've got 34, 7, and 13. Abraham is mentioned most, which probably doesn't surprise us. If you look in the book of Acts alone, you've got eight references to Abraham, four to Isaac, and seven to Jacob. Okay, fair enough. If you look in the letters to the Jewish Christians, you've got 13 references to Abraham, five to Jacob, sorry, five to Isaac, three to Jacob. And even in Paul's earlier letters, you've got 19 references to Abraham, three references to Isaac, and two to Jacob. Okay, fair enough. Now, how many references do we have in Paul's later letters? How many times does Abraham occur? The answer is zero. Isaac, zero. Jacob, zero. Something's changed. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob are now irrelevant. They were not irrelevant during the Gospels. They were not irrelevant during the time covered by the Acts of the Apostles. They were not irrelevant in the Jewish letters, which doesn't surprise us. But it, they weren't, you know, they were relevant, sorry, during the Jewish letters, and that shouldn't surprise us. And they were relevant during Paul's earlier letters. But in his later letters, they're not relevant. They're not relevant. If you look at all those very Jewish words, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, Israelite, Moses, Hebrews, Jew, Jew, Jewish, you know, you've got stacks and stacks, 205 references approximately in the Gospels, 144 in the Acts of the Apostles alone, 44 in the Jewish letters, the Jewish Christian letters, 80 in Paul's earlier letters, but just seven afterwards. Something has changed. Now, even those seven, I'm not going to look at all of them. You can look at them yourself for your homework, but let's just turn to one passage, Philippians chapter 3. Let's see, Paul uses these Jewish words quite a lot in this passage. Let's have a look what he actually says about these Jewish words, because many of them occur here. He says in verse 3, it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. When he's talking about putting no confidence in the flesh, he's basically talking about ritual ordinances, things done by other human beings. I don't have any confidence in those things, though I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in flesh, in humanity, in human situations... I have more. I can have confidence in this, he says. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Right, now you've got a stack of Jewish words here. Is Paul boasting here? Look at me. This is my credentials. No, he's not. He's going to knock all these out of the way and say they're all totally irrelevant. 
Look at what he says. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish. What, being circumcised rubbish, Paul? Being a Hebrew of the Hebrews rubbish? Being of the people of Israel rubbish? Being a Pharisee rubbish? Yeah. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. That's what he's interested in now. Those credentials were totally important to Paul during the book of Acts. Without those credentials, he would never have got into a synagogue. Well, he could have sat at the back, but he would never come to the front part of the synagogue, and they certainly would never have asked him to speak. Those things were very important during the book of Acts. Now they're rubbish, he says. And notice what he says in verse 2. What does he say in verse 2? Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision. Well, during Acts, Paul, you circumcised Timothy. Yes, I know I had to during the Acts. It was still important. Timothy was a Jew. His mother was a Jew. She should have had him circumcised. Timothy had a good testimony. I wanted to take him on my journeys. I wanted to take him on my mission journeys. I wanted him to speak in synagogues. Well, they wouldn't have let him because he wasn't circumcised. So I had to circumcise Timothy. It was right. It was proper. Now, circumcision's irrelevant. Being a Hebrew of the Hebrews is irrelevant. Being of the tribe of Benjamin, irrelevant. Being of the house of Israel, irrelevant. It doesn't matter. They're all rubbish. They're all rubbish now, says Paul. So even though you've got down that right-hand side and you see some of these words occurring a few times, when you actually look up the references, it doesn't actually tell you anything positive about them. What it actually does is tell you something rather negative about them. Rather like in Colossians 3.11, if you look at this, it says there's neither Jew nor Gentile. That's the reference to Jew. One of the references to Jews afterwards. Now, think about that. Think about that. There is definitely something that has changed, totally changed. Jerusalem is an interesting one, you know. Look at the number of references to Jerusalem. 66 in the Gospels. That doesn't surprise you. 61 in Acts. Okay. Four in the letters written to Jewish Christians, ten in Paul's earlier letters, none afterwards. Why not? Think about it. What did Paul do at the end of every one of his missionary journeys? He went up to Jerusalem. True? <coughs> he went up to Jerusalem. At the end of every one of his missionary journeys, he went up to Jerusalem. Now, he's in prison for two years. He writes Ephesians. Colossians, Philemon, at the beginning of those two years, he writes Philippians at the end. And he hopes to be released. And if you look at the details of the pastoral epistles, it's obvious that he was released. He, visit, he talks about visiting places that he never visited in the book of Acts. He talks about visiting them with different people. Some of the places he visited in Acts, he visited them in a different order. So it's pretty clear that when Paul, at the end of those two years, Paul was released and he went to see the Philippians and he went to see other people. There's one place he did not go and is not mentioned in the pastorals. And that's Jerusalem. Now, why didn't Paul go back to Jerusalem? He'd have thought that was the obvious place. Well, no, I told you about it. What had happened was Annas the high priest had killed James, had killed John, had killed all the Jewish Christian leaders in Jerusalem. So what's the point of him going back? There's no point in him going back at all. And he doesn't go back. So anyway... If you want to take this and look at it, um, if you want to look at it and do some more study on it, check those references down the right-hand side, see what he actually says about those very interesting things, and maybe you can add some other subjects to that list for yourself. <clears throat> so what did not change? Certain things changed at the end of the book of Acts. <clears throat> but we have to recognize that certain things did not change. Excuse me. <clears throat> I have a frog in my throat. First of all, the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in Christ's death for our sins and his resurrection verifying our justification. That doesn't change. That message is exactly the same. 
What doesn't change is the moral teaching, good and evil, right and wrong. And in fact, there's very little change in the moral teaching right from the giving of the Mosaic law. I mean, adultery is still wrong. Drunkenness is wrong throughout. Lying is wrong. Loving your neighbor is good. So, so if you're going to look at moral teaching, it doesn't change. And in actual fact, the truth, of, the, the truth of God's righteousness coming through faith doesn't change. Abraham believed God and he counted him for righteousness, even before the law was given. God has always wanted faith from his people, trust from his people. He wants his people to believe in him. And if they believe in him, trust in him, and have faith in him, he will give them righteousness. Now what happens is sometimes what they have to believe changes. Abraham, an old man who was past having child, child incapable of having children, his wife had gone past it. God said, you know, look at, those, look at the stars in the sky. Your posterity is going to be like that. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. What did those Jews have to believe when Jesus was on earth that he was the Christ, the Son of God? That's what they had to believe. What do we have to believe? We need to believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again on the third day. So what people have to believe may differ, but the principle of God's righteousness being given by grace through faith is a principle that goes right on. But what did change? First of all, the Jews lost first place. That's what changed at the end of the book of Acts. Right from Abraham's day onward, the Jew was first and the Gentile was very much second. That's throughout the Old Testament, that's through the Gospels, that's through the Acts of the Apostles. Paul uses a new expression, a totally new expression, the heavenly realms, which you won't find earlier. And that is the situation today. But Jews losing first place, Jews and Gentiles now being one, and the use of the heavenly realms, that's the situation today. But it did not start with Christ. It didn't start at Pentecost. It started at the end of the book of Acts. So that's what we have to recognize. They lost their first place and they lost their equality right at the end of the book of Acts. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 14 to 19, because he makes this clear. But now in Christ Jesus, you Gentiles who once were far away have been brought near through the brother Christ. For he has made the two, the Jewish Gentile, the Jewish Christian, the Gentile Christian, one. They've been made one. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two. The Jewish Christian, the Gentile Christian, the book of Acts, were significantly different. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but are fellow citizens with God's people and fellow members of God's household. That's talking about equality. That's your situation now. And he says, this mystery, this is a secret. This is a secret. And he says this wasn't revealed to previous generations and ages. This secret is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And the Greek really emphasizes co-heirs, co-members, co-sharers. That is, equal heirs, equal members, equal sharers. Israel does not have first place. There is no such priority. Now, many of our we are, we, there's a good work going on amongst certain parts of the Jewish community, Messianic Christians. They love Romans, but they hate Ephesians. I, I have one friend, he, he married a Jewish Christian, ooh, 25, 26 years ago. And she likes Romans. She likes the Jewish nation being first. She likes Jewish Christians being first. She, after all these years, she still apparently does not accept Ephesian teaching will not accept it, will not accept it. And, and this, this is, I'm sorry, you can be a Jewish Christian today, you can have your Jewish music, you can have your form of worship, totally different. It doesn't really worry me, but don't think you are superior. Don't think you are not. 
You may have been from Abraham's day until the end of the book of Acts. You may have been when Paul wrote Romans. You're not today. Now, what you must not do is read this situation, read this situation which was revealed at the end of the book of Acts, back into the Acts of the Apostles, or back into the Acts period, or back into the Gospel period. If you read this back into those periods of time, you will misunderstand passages in the Gospels, you will misunderstand passages in Acts, you will misunderstand passages in those earlier letters. You can't. You can't harmonize the whole of the New Testament, which is what some people like to do. They want to harmonize the whole lot. You can't. How can you harmonize this with what Jesus Christ said, I've only been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. How can you harmonize it when he sent out the twelve and says, do not go into the way of the Gentiles? You can't harmonize it. What you have to realize is we've got progressive revelation. We've been moving in time. God's purpose has been changing. This is God's current purpose. The Jews and the Gentiles are now one. How did he make them one? What did he actually do? Well, what helps us is putting it in his context. Remember, the differences in Acts were mainly centered on circumcision, the law of Moses, and ceremonially uncleanness. Those are the big issues, if you look about them, in the book of Acts. Right? The Gentiles had to be circumcised, said some of the Christian Jews, and keep the law of Moses, and they were very concerned about the Gentiles being unclean. Okay, so, how has he made them one? Well, he tells us here in Ephesians 2, 14 to 17. What does he say there? But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier. Now what was the barrier between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians? What was it? The dividing wall of hostility. What's this dividing wall of hostility? Well there's a dividing wall in the temple. There was the outer courts of the Gentiles and then there was the dividing wall in which there was a notice saying anybody who was not circumcised passes through this door or this way in on the penalty of death. This was the dividing wall of hostility. What did he do? He abolished in his flesh the law with its commandments and ordinances. Christ has abolished the law. Now this comes at the end of Ephesians. This comes at the end of the book of Acts. Don't read the abolition of the law back into the Acts period. Don't read, don't read the abolition of the law back into the Gospels. That's what some people do. I talked this morning about how some people say that Christ was trying to undo the law when his disciples were going through the cornfield picking ears of corn on the Sabbath day. They were perfectly entitled by the law of Moses to do that. It was the Pharisaic additions to the law that he was having a go at. That's what he was having a go at. Don't read this ab abolishment of the law back into the Acts period because otherwise you end up with James and the elders in Jerusalem and Paul making a huge faux pas because when Paul gets back to Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey people have made false accusations about him. Now what did a Jew want to do or what should a Jew do if people had made false accusations against him and he wanted to say this is not true? He took a Nazarite vow, shaved his head and made his offerings. James and the elders, which would have included Peter, Thomas, and all the apostles, and Paul, said, okay, let's do this. Oh, he was wrong to do that, you see, he's keeping the law. Well, of course he's keeping the law. Paul kept the law throughout the book of Acts. Where did he go every Sabbath day? To the synagogue. How many times did he go up to Jerusalem to keep feasts? Two or three times, we can read about that in the book of Acts. What did he say when he abused the high priest? He apologized, because the law said you should not treat the Lord's anointed like that. Paul was very, very concerned that he was, what does he say in Philippians? As for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. Paul lived the good Jewish life during the book of Acts. How were the two made one? Here it comes again in Colossians 2, 14 to 17. What does he say? He's cancelled the written code with his regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Okay? Now, because of that, some people say, ah, the law's abolished at the cross. 
No, the law was fulfilled at the cross. Right? I, the law was fulfilled at the cross. And from that point onwards, he could abolish the law any time he liked. But he didn't abolish it during the book of Acts because he was concerned about the people of Israel. He wanted the people of Israel to repent. And therefore, it was necessary for the Christian Jew to witness to the non-Christian Jew. And therefore, the Christian Jew had to carry on keeping the law. Otherwise, he would not have been a credible person to those Jews who did not believe in Jesus. They, the Jews who didn't believe in Jesus would have called any, any Christian Jew who didn't keep the law a Gentile dog and would not have listened to him. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what? What do you eat or drink? Or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. So basically, if you want to eat pork, you can eat pork. If you don't want to eat pork, don't. If you want to eat duck, eat duck. If you don't want to eat duck, don't. If you want to eat the meat of strangled animals, you can. If you don't want to eat the meat of strangled animals, don't. You see the freedom here? Don't let anyone judge you by what you eat, right? So, so you know, hey, this is freedom now. This is freedom. It's not a prescription. You have to eat duck. You have to eat pork. No, it's up to you. It's entirely up to you. Or a Sabbath day. Great big issues are made in America sometimes about the Ten Commandments. I'd want to change that to the Nine, actually. Because none of us keep the Sabbath day. Sabbath day is Friday evening to Saturday evening. Amen. Sabbath day is that you couldn't light a fire. Well, that may be okay in St. Louis. But you go up in Wisconsin, January, February, March, try not lighting a fire. You'd freeze to death. I'm not joking. You would. You know, you've got temperatures up there in January, February of sometimes minus 20, minus 30, and with a windshield coming off that Canadian ice, I mean, it's down to minus 70. I mean, you couldn't do that. And what, did you, what should you do anyway? If you're going to keep the Sabbath law, what are you going to do with people who break the Sabbath law? Stone them to death. The authorities would love you doing that. And not only that, most of you couldn't even go to church because you couldn't go more than about two-thirds of a mile on the Sabbath day. Right? Now, what we do is follow, was it all Scripture is beneficial, all Scripture is profitable? We follow a Sabbath principle. We think it's a good idea to get together one day a week to get together for corporate worship of the Lord. And that's a good principle. And also we should follow the principle of having a day's rest. Our body, our minds need a day's rest. And one of the reasons we have such great stress sometimes is the amount of time people are working. Some people are doing two jobs. You know, I know it's hard for them to make ends meet and I, I'm not criticizing them here. But the simple fact is if you carry on working, 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 you know, some of our top sports people are having huge problems. I mean, one time we used to have distinct seasons. You know, you used to play soccer or rugby for six months, then you played cricket for six months. And during the summer season, all the soccer and rugby players would have it off. And during the summer, during the winter, all the cricket players would have it off. Now they go touring all around the world to make as much money as they can, and they're all having huge problems. Some of our fast pitchers in cricket that used to go on until they were 35, 36 have cracked by the time they're 30 because they're not giving that rest to their body. So we follow that. You see, all these things were a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. That's the important thing. The reality is Christ. And if we have got Christ, we are one. If the Gentiles got Christ, he's, got, he's one with the Jew who's got Christ. It's the same with us. There might not be this Jew-Gentile distinction anymore, but if we've got Christ, we are one with the Baptist who's got Christ. We may disagree with the Baptist over certain things, but that's a different issue. We are one. We may disagree with the, with the Methodist who's got Christ. Okay, fair enough. We may disagree with him, but we're one. We are one. The reality is Christ. Paul opens this term. He has this very unusual term which he introduces in Ephesians. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Wow, that's, that's incredible, isn't it? We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ and in the heavenly realms. They're spiritual blessings. Israel had physical blessings. 
If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, you will read there where God says, if you fully obey my commandments, etc., I will bless you with, and you've got a whole list of blessings, and they're all to do with things on this earth. They, they, you know, their, their crops will do well. Their, their families will do well. Their livestock will do well. This, this is the blessings, the earthly blessings promised to Israel. Huh? Don't, don't, don't go down the road of some preachers in America. Is the reason, America, you have so much food is because God is blessing you. There's nothing to do with that, sorry. God's blessing all the, all the Americans that don't believe in God. You've got a country which is a good farm country. You have a country which is pretty well administrated by your politicians. They defend you. you you've got good police. You've got good fire services. You've got good agriculture. Thank the Lord for our, for our system of governance. You know, that's why we have a good system. Go to, go to Zimbabwe and tell the Zimbabwean Christians that the reason they haven't got enough food is because they're not good enough Christians. <laughs> Rubbish. Zimbabwe used to be the breadbasket of Africa. It was one of the richest agricultural countries in Africa. They've now got this guy called Mugabe who's ruined the country. Such, such a shame. We have every spiritual blessing in heavenly realms. It's quite amazing. And he says, he talks about the power. He, want, he wants people to get to know certain things, the hope of their calling and the, the power that is available to us. And that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly realms. So if we're in any doubt where the heavenly realms are, this tells us very clearly it is where Christ is now. This is where Christ is. He is seated in the heavenly realms, far above all, at God's right hand. And we are being blessed with every spiritual blessing in that position at the present moment. But Ephesians 2 verse 6, 7 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that... You see, it's got the present tense here. It's got the present tense. Now, it's very interesting that if you look at prophecy, we normally expect prophecy to be in the present tense, in, in the future tense. But some prophecies are in the past tense. And you can understand those because sometimes a prophet will have a vision and then he'll describe what he saw in the vision. So he puts it in the past tense. And yet it's describing something in the future. Some prophecies are in the present tense. And I think the reason why you have this this present prophetic tense is the things are so certain and sure, God says, as far as I'm concerned, you're there now. It's so certain that you're going to be there, you're there now. So, what does he say? God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages, so we're going to be in these heavenly realms for coming ages. However long that is, I don't know. But the age, when it's used in the Bible, refers to a long period of time. This is plural. In coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Now, let's just dwell on that a moment. Think about this. Because this, to me, you know, it's very, it's very, oh, sorry, it's much easier to talk about the kingdom upon the earth. It's much easier to talk about the kingdom from heaven upon the earth. It's much easier to talk about the millennial kingdom because we are of the earth. Some people struggle to think about what we're going to do in heaven. No, we're not all going to play harps or play, play on clouds and all sorts of stuff like that, right? What are we going to do? What, what are we going to do? And the nearest you can get is something like this. You think about his grace. If we think about his grace, if I think about his grace, you might disagree with me slightly here, that's fair enough. If I think about God's grace, I think about he's taken away my sin. You know, um, he's, he's given me eternal life. I, I'm going to have, I'm going to be raised to the heavenly places. Okay, fair enough. If I think about the riches of his grace, I think about well, hang on a minute. If you just take away my sins and leave me as I am, there's not going to be much good there. No, I'm going to clothe you with Christ's righteousness. Wow, that's rich. And not only that, I'm going to give you a new body fashioned like unto Christ's resurrection body. 
That's staggering. You know, that's, maybe that's the riches of his grace. If I think about the incomparable riches of his grace, I have no idea what he's talking about. Because we learn so much by comparison. That's how we teach kids. You know, this is taller than that. Something is heavier than this or lighter than this. This is a darker color than that color. Seven is greater than five. We learn an awful lot by comparison. When we can't compare it with anything, we struggle. We struggle. And that's why many people struggle when they get into algebra. Never seen anything like it before. Or when they get into calculus. I mean, what's going on here? You know, I haven't got a clue, you know. And, and so they struggle until they get, they get familiar with it and they start building it up. But basically, when you haven't got anything to compare with, it's very, very difficult. So, so what are we going to do in eternity? We're not only going to enjoy God's grace, not only are we going to be shown the riches of God's grace, we're going to be shown the incomparable riches of God's grace, and it's going to take coming ages. That's fantastic. You don't hear anything about this in the Acts of the, P, Acts of the Apostles or the earlier letters, and you don't hear anything about it in, in, in the Gospels. And all of this is expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a lovely, simple word? Kindness. God is kind. God is kind. So beware. Don't read the abolishment of the Mosaic law, which comes at the end of Acts, back into the Acts period. Don't do it. Don't read it back into the Gospel periods. If you do, you will make misunderstandings. Ephesians is the book that dominates everybody's theology. Doesn't make any difference what their theology is. Everybody has, sees Ephesians as the high watermark of Holy Revelation. What most of our friends do is not ignore Ephesians. What most of our friends do is read other things in the light of Ephesians. When I was writing my commentary on Galatians, I got very frustrated because I like to compare, particularly, other people's writings and see what they got to say. And I got so frustrated because every single commentary I read interpreted Galatians in the light of Ephesians. There's no way I could do that. Galatians came even before the Jerusalem Council. Ephesians comes at the end of the book of Acts. I can't, I can't interpret Galatians in the light of Ephesians. No way can you actually do it. So I, don't, I can't read these things back. Don't read the equalities of Jewish and Gentile Christians which came at the end of the Acts back into the Acts period, or well, back into the Gospel period. You can't do that. You, you'll start getting things wrong. You'll misunderstand what the Apostle Paul is doing. You, you won't understand what Jesus is doing. If you try and harmonize all these things, you can't harmonize them. It's not. Recognize the differences. Distinguish the differences. Try and explain the differences. Because if you recognize the differences, if you admit the differences, you'll then start seeking an explanation. And that will increase your understanding of the scriptures and, un and increase your understanding of the plan of God. And don't read the heavenly realms back into the Acts period or the Gospel period. It's not there. <clears throat> you can't do this. Remember, an interesting little thing here, Abraham lived to be 175 years old. So how many Sabbath days did Abraham keep? Well, if you'd like to work out 175 times 52, I hope you'll get the answer zero. Because that's how many days Abraham kept. Because the Sabbath day didn't come until halfway through Exodus. Abraham lived in Genesis. There's no Sabbath days in Genesis. You know, for Abraham's time, there isn't. And you'll see Abraham doing funny things in Genesis, things which are against the law of Moses. So was he a terrible sinner, Abraham? No, he was living by the law of his day. The law of his day was, a, was called the Code of Hammurabi, who was a king in the era of the Chaldees area. And he was a very good king, and he was one of the first people to codify law, put it on big plinths, and put it out in public places so that people would know what the law was. And one of the laws was that if... If a husband and wife couldn't have children, then uh, what could happen was that the woman could give her handmaid to her husband, and the child the handmaiden had would become the mistress's child. It wasn't the man taking the handmaiden. <laughs> it was the woman giving the handmaiden to her husband. And that's what he did with Sarah. That's what Sarah did. 
Sarah was just keeping the law. She was wrong to do it in God's plan, but she wasn't doing anything particularly wrong. And Abraham comes back at God and says, look, God, you've given me no male heir, and this Eliza, this, 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 my chief steward will become my heir. Yes, he would have done. That's the code of Amorabi. If a rich person had people working for him and he had no male heir, when he died, basically his chief steward took over, everybody moved up one, and he had stability. And that's what he wanted. He wanted stability. So that's what Abraham was doing. Abraham was not under the Mosaic law. He just wasn't. So anyway, for a straightforward overview of the Bible, there's two books out there which you might like. One is introducing God's plan, which is much, much easier and, and good for people who don't know very much about the Bible. And the other is approaching the Bible, which we've already mentioned. Thank you. So, we can ask some questions? Yes, let's go. You and me. Okay, if you've got your sheets there, it'll help you. If you look at verse 15, he says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. By no means. What's going on here in this Roman church? What's going on here? You see, grace leads to liberty, to freedom, but grace should not lead to license. We can do what we like. So what was going on in the Roman church? What was the problem there? Well, if you look at verse 1, if you look at verse 1, this is the second time Paul's asked the question in verse 15. First time he asks it is in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. By no means. Shall we go on sinning? Now, we all sin occasionally, and Paul says in Galatians, if a brother is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual, restore him. But gently, in case you get caught yourself, 
We can all get caught in a sin. But notice what he says here. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? Shall we go on sinning? Shall we carry on in sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. By no means. Now, how on earth, how on earth could a Christian church come to that conclusion? That basically you can carry on sinning and sinning and sinning and singing because this would exalt God's grace. It would exalt God's love. It would exalt God's forgiveness and show just how wonderful a God is, wonderful love, wonderful grace, wonderful forgiveness. Wow, how on earth, how on earth did the people in this church in Rome come to this conclusion? Okay, let's put ourselves back into that period of time. Let's see what happened. First of all, let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost, as we know. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 5, we read, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Okay? This were the Jews of the dispersion. The Jews of the dispersion. Those who were scattered. Scattered throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. Now, many of those Jews liked to come up to Jerusalem for one of the big feast days whenever they could manage to find the time or the money or whatever it may be. And there were many of them staying there. Now, some of those Jews, if you look at verse um, 10, it gives you a list of all of the different nations, and he talks about Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. <clears throat> okay, so there they were. They were Jews from Rome, plus what we would call proselytes. These were Gentiles, these converts to Judaism were Gentiles who had decided to embrace the, the Judaism of that time, to come and worship Jehovah. And it was perfectly okay under the law of Moses and throughout the Old Testament for any Gentile to do that. All the Gentiles had to do was obey the Sabbath, be circumcised, and then their offerings would be acceptable. So out of all these thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Jews from all these different countries, about 3,000 of them were baptized that day. <clears throat> and we read, if we go on to chapter 4, verse 4, um, he carries on, carries on just after the day of Pentecost. And what does it tell us there? But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Okay, so this was the situation. This was not just a situation on the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost. There was a feast of Pentecost every year. There was a feast of tabernacles every year. You know, there was the Passover every year. There was atonement every year. And for each of these feasts, these Jews of the scattered Jews, these Jews of the dispersion, these Jews from every nation under heaven came up to Jerusalem. Came up to Jerusalem. And we know the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, by and large. Even if you remember a little bit later in Acts, when the persecution and the Saul of Tarsus got so great, all the Jews from Jerusalem scattered to places like Samaria and even to places like Crete, but the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. It tells us that. So they had an ever-changing missionary field, and they would be there talking to these Jews that came up to Jerusalem about Jesus of Nazareth, that he was the Christ, the Son of God, he was their Savior. Now these Jews would go back. They would go back to their... <clears throat> 
their own cities, their own towns, their own synagogues, and they would be telling people there that the Messiah had come. The Messiah had come. And the reaction they got was, one suspects, very similar to the reaction the Apostle Paul got later, in that some of them believed and some opposed. And it looks like, if you read very carefully, it looks like the ones who opposed were the leadership. And if you read letters like the letters to James, you will see that James is talking about Jewish Christians who are suffering at the hands of other Jews. Not suffering at the hands of the Romans, suffering at the hands of other Jews. And so we get this situation. Now on this day of Pentecost, on the first day of Pentecost that we read about, there were Jews there from Rome. Now, 5,000 got saved. So what happened? Well, I suspect what happened was that some of these Jews went back to Rome and the Christian church at Rome was started. If it wasn't started on this day of Pentecost, maybe it was the following year or the next feast or somewhere around, around about like that. We have this situation that the churches, many of the churches that were started were probably started by people like this, unnamed Jews that we don't know about. How did the church in Spain start? We have no idea. But Paul says he wants to go to Spain. How did the church in Egypt start? Well, it tells us here that there were people there from Egypt. People there from Egypt. So some of these Egyptian Jews would go back to Egypt. they tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, and they got saved. Now, go to Acts chapter 16. Go to Acts chapter 16. Here we have Paul on his second missionary journey. Paul on his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16, verse 6, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Paul's desire was to go down south. He was heading westward. He wanted to go south into Asia, down to a region known as the Lycus Valley, where there were three big cities, Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. Paul wanted to go there. But the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not going to go there. Why didn't the Spirit want Paul to go into that region? Because there was no need for Paul to go into that region. We know that what happened from the book of Colossians is that Epaphras, Epaphras, had taken the message to that region. Now Epaphras was a Jew. Epaphras was a, we don't know where Epaphras was saved or how he was saved. We have no idea. Maybe he was one of these Jews that had gone up to Jerusalem on one of these feast days, somewhere along the line, had got saved and had taken the message of Jesus back to Colossae, back to that region, back to Laodicea. So there was no need for Paul to go there. Verse 7, when they came to the border of Mysia, they traveled, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Now, why he didn't want them to go into Bithynia, I don't really have any ideas. If anybody's got any ideas, okay, let me know afterwards. Anyway, so they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so Paul goes into Macedonia, he goes into Philippi, he goes into Europe. And I have read in so many commentaries, and I've heard it from so many pulpits, that this was the first time the gospel was preached in Europe. But it's not true. It's not true. The gospel had probably been preached in Europe long before that. How can I say that? Well, look what happens. Paul actually leaves Philippi and he goes to Thessalonica. He, from Thessalonica he goes to Berea. From Berea he goes to Athens. And from Athens he goes down to Corinth. And when he gets to Corinth, an interesting thing happens if you look at Acts chapter 18 verse 1. And after this Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Claudius, the governor, sorry, the Caesar, had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. 
Now, Claudius was a very good Caesar, right? I mean, he was surrounded by a couple of idiots called uh, Caligula and Nero, but he himself was one of the most outstanding of Caesars. In fact, it was him who plotted the downfall of Britain, actually. <laughs> right? he, he, was a, he was a weakling, he was deformed, he was highly intelligent. Most, the most unlikely Roman Caesar there ever was. But he, he knew his history and he was fascinated by military campaigns. And the British kings had combined to defeat the Romans on a number of occasions. So during the time of the Book of Acts, all this happened. The Roman defeat of Britain takes place at this point in time. Claudius goes across to Britain and he, and he sits on a hill and tells his uh, Roman centurions, his Roman commanders, right, go to battle against the English. And he watched what the English did. They, and they defeated the Roman army. He withdrew the army. He sat there, he planned the strategy and said, right, this is what you're going to do. And that's exactly what they did, and they defeated the British kings. So this dear old guy, Claudius, defeated us. Right, okay. Now, what's going on here? Claudius, by and large, was a very good Caesar, a compassionate person. He hated putting people to death. But what had happened is, look, these were Christians, and they'd come out of Rome. So therefore, the Christian message in Rome was there before Paul got to Philippi. Now, what was happening in Rome was that the Jewish Christians were evangelizing. And they were having a fair amount of success. So much so that people were leaving the pagan temples. And if people were leaving the pagan temples, what did that mean? It basically meant that the temple people had less money. And so some of the priests of the temple went and complained to Claudius about it. Now Claudius was very happy with freedom of, freedom of religion, but he didn't like people pinching each other's followers. He didn't like the Jews, as he called it, proselytizing. He didn't like the Jews proselytizing, because to Claudius it made no difference whether you're a Christian Jew or an Orthodox Jew, you're all Jewish. They were all Jews. It was all the Jewish religion. They didn't see Christianity as different. It was just one of these subgroups of Judaism which the Romans never understood. You know, Sadducees and Pharisees and Essenes and, oh gosh, I don't know what's going on with all this lot. You know, they never understood it. So he had ordered an edict that the Jews stop proselytizing. Well, the Christian Jews just didn't stop. They carried on evangelizing. So Claudius just, as his favorite punishment was, was to banish them. He banished them. And so all the Christian Jews and all the Orthodox Jews got kicked out of Rome. They got kicked out of Rome. Now, what was the implications of that? Go to Romans chapter 3. The implications of that for the Gentile Christians in Rome was quite serious. Because they'd done a lot of evangelizing, they had a lot of new converts, a lot of recent converts. Now, these were Gentile converts from paganism. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage, then, is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Well, at that time, Romans was written during the time covered by the book of Acts. He says, much in every way. There were many advantages at that point in time in being a Jew, being a Jewish Christian as opposed to being a Gentile Christian. And he says, much in every way, first of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. The Jewish Christians had the scriptures. They had the words of God. They understood the character of God. They understood his holiness. They understood the law of Moses. They understood the need for them to be holy. They understood all these things. And they were the teachers, the leaders, the evangelists at that point in time. If you read through the book of Acts, you will find all the leaders, all the teachers, everything was done by Jewish Christians. There's no Gentile evangelists or Gentile teachers. Pretty obvious why. They didn't know the scriptures. You know, you, you can't. You get somebody coming into your church and they get saved. You don't ask them a month later to lead the Bible study, do you? You know, you may, you may in two or three, four years or something, you know, so these people had to learn. They didn't know. They didn't know. So, what happened then? What was the effect of this upon the 
Gentile Christians who were left in Rome. The Gentile Christians who had just started to understand the grace of God. The Gentile Christians who started understanding that this God, this Jehovah God, this God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ was not an angry God. It was not a God you had to pacify. You know, with sacrifices and animals and things like this. Jesus Christ, with his sacrifice for sin, had taken away all sin. That he had pacified God. He'd made the payment. You know, this was a different God. This was a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of patience, a God of forgiveness. Wow, this is fantastic. So what you mean then, he forgives me all my sins. So that, that's really fantastic. The God, look how gracious he is. So really, in fact, the more sins I do, that makes him more gracious. And they were on their own. They didn't have any Jewish Christians to put them right. They had, they had no Jewish Christians to put them right at all. They were Gentile Christians struggling. Struggling to work out how the grace of God works. How the love of God works. If you go to Ephesians chapter 3. See, they did not know. They hadn't learned. They hadn't become acquainted with... We are in such an advantageous position compared to them. If you look, if you look at Ephesians chapter... Uh, 4, it is chapter 4, verse 29. He says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that they may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. If you behave like this, you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Yes, he will forgive you. He still loves you. And the fact that he grieves is an indication that he loves you. You know, our, our own children, when they're growing up, when they do some of those things kids tend to do in their teenage years, it grieves us. It upsets us. You know, of course we love them. It's not going to stop us loving them. Of course we forgive them. It's not going to stop us forgiving them. But it, it, it grieves us. It grieves us. And it's the same with God. Okay, he's not, he's not going to for, stop forgiving you. He's not going to stop loving you. But you are causing him a lot of pain. Now the Roman Gentile Christians, totally on their own, know nothing about this, understand nothing about God's holiness, understands nothing about God cannot look on sin. So this is why he, if you go back to your sheets now, if you go back to Romans 6, the right-hand side, this is why they had come to this conclusion. Oh, you know, shall, what should we do? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? Absolutely not, says Paul. Absolutely not. He says, verse 5, If we have been united with Christ like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. You know, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, you're united with him. You're one with him. And you're going to be one with him in his death, and you'll be one with him in his resurrection. And for we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with. The body of sin should be done away with when we become believers, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. <clears throat> That's the point. Slaves to sin. As I say, don't misunderstand certain passages of Scripture. In John's Gospel, I think it says, no, John's Epistle, in the King James Version, it has, he who is born of God does not sin. Well, that's not true. You, you, you can see Peter doing it. Well, well after the resurrection and after his firm commitment to Christ. He goes down to Antioch and he refuses to eat with Gentiles. You know, you can see Paul and Barnabas doing it. They argue so much, they have to separate. Uh, and what does Paul say when he, writes, when he writes later on in Romans? You know, the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the evil I don't want to do, that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, he says. This is, this is the human condition. This is the human condition. We will every so often slip up. We will every so often say the wrong thing and maybe every so often occasionally do the wrong thing. <clears throat> 
But are we slaves to sin? Now, slaves to sin basically mean you continue in sin, you practice in sin. And that's, what, that's how you should translate that verse in John's epistle. He who was born of God does not continue in sin, does not practice sin, isn't a slave to sin. And that's what he's saying here. You know, that body of sin might be done away with so that we are no longer slaves to sin. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin. A dead person doesn't react. Therefore, if you're dead to sin, you're not going to react to the temptation. You're just not going to react to it. There will be temptations. There will be temptations to do wrong. There will be temptations not to do right. Well, don't react to it. Just don't do the wrong and just do the right. So, in the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So you're dead to these sinful temptations, but you're alive to what God wants you to do. You're alive to God. God wants you to do. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Don't let sin take charge of you. Don't give in. Don't give in to temptation. Don't give in to the peer group. Don't, go in, don't give in to living like this. See, that was a huge temptation to many of those Roman Christians at that time. Many of them had been recent converts. They'd come out of their pagan temples in Rome with their terrible practices. I think Bacchus was the Roman god of wine. And that they could just get themselves totally drunk in the worship of Bacchus. You know, this, this is, that's the sort of things that went on. And they were slipping back into that. They were thinking, not only were they slipping back into it, they thought it was perfectly okay. Because God was going to forgive them anyway. So sin was reigning in their bodies. Don't let sin reign in your bodies. Don't let it take charge of you. And he says in verse 13, Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. You know, you can offer your parts of your body to sin. The clearest il illustration here is that of sex. But it could be your taste buds, your, your love of alcohol. It could be all sorts of things. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to offer myself to God. I'm not going to offer my body to this pagan god or these people I used to get drunk with or these people I used to carouse with. I'm not going to offer my parts of my body to them. I'll offer it to God as those who have been brought from death to life. You have been brought from death to life. The Romans, Christians, have been brought from death to life. They now had eternal life. So don't offer your body... Don't offer them to sin. Offer the parts of your body to God as instruments of righteousness. Isn't that lovely? Your body is an instrument of righteousness. And so these Romans were faced with this. They could either offer their bodies as instruments of wickedness, indulging in sensual, sexual, permissive, drunkenness, all those types of behavior, or they could offer their body as instruments of righteousness. You could do good. You can help each other. You can support each other. You can counsel each other. This is what you can do. And he goes back again. He keeps hammering on this point. He keeps hammering on this point. For sin shall not be your master. Don't give in to it. Don't let it reign in your bodies. Don't be slaves to it. Don't let it be your master. You know, you are going to be tempted. You have an old nature and a new nature. What are you going to give in to? Are you going to feed your old nature or are you going to feed your new nature? Feed your new nature and your old nature will suffer from atrophy. It'll start to shrink. That's what will happen to it. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. Just because you have freedom, don't think you can let sin be your master. Right? You are not under the law. You're not under the Mosaic law. True. You Gentiles are not under the Mosaic law. You're not under any law, really. You are under grace. Because you're under grace, do not let sin be your master. Don't. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? 
So if you are going to offer your body to sin and temptation, you're going to be slaves to sin and temptation. And you're not going to be able to withstand the sin and the temptation. You will just do it. You will just go with it. We talk about having a conscience which is seared. You know, we, we can become like that. You know, we can do one thing once and we feel bad about it. But then we can do it the second time and we feel less bad about it. And we do it again and the third time we feel a bit awkward about it. And the fourth time we feel, oh, perhaps we shouldn't have done that really. And the fifth time we think, oh dear. And the sixth time we don't even think. We just go and go and go. That's the slippery slope to slavery to sin. Right. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or whether you are slaves to obedient, which leads to righteousness. That's the point. What's it going to be? What's it going to be for you Roman Christians? Are you going to become slaves to sin, or are you going to become slaves to obedience? Which you're going to do? Which you're going to do? So, well, who or what are we slaves to? Now, basically, many people out in the world are slaves to sin. <clears throat> they, it may not be immoral type of things, because that's what we tend to think of, but they're slaves to sin. Now, I, I know some people, <clears throat> when we lived in Wisconsin, they watch football on Thursday night. They went to high school football on Friday night. They watch three games of football on Sun Saturday. All watch all the college footballs on television. Watch three NFLs on the on the Sunday and one NFL on the Monday. They're slaves to sin. Absolutely, totally. You know. Well, I like sport. I'm wearing my Welsh rugby tie today. You know, that's what I'm wearing. Yes, because Wales won, beat Ireland in the World Cup. Very good. I like sport. Fair enough, it's good relaxation. And we all need rest, because that's the Sabbath principle. We all need relaxation. I'm not going to argue with that. But you can become slaves to something which, okay, initially is not particularly a sinful thing. You know? Other people get slaves to pornography. Men in particular have a big problem with it. Lots of men have big problems with internet pornography in particular. You know? It's, it's, it's a temptation. They just have a look once, and then a month later they have another look, and then two weeks later they have another look, and then a week later they have another look, and then two days later they have another look, and they're there every day. They're there every day. They become slaves, slaves to it. Sadly, you get people who are slaves to tobacco. You get people who are slaves to alcohol. You get people who are slaves to sex. Now, many of these things, okay, if you're a slave to these things, you're not a slave to Christ, you're not a slave to God, you've got eternal death. But what about these things? What are they going to give you? They're going to give you ill health and probably early death. So, why are you slaves to them? Why? What do they repay you with? Immediate pleasure at long-term expense. Verse 17. But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. Paul's being very positive and kind to them here. You, he's saying, look, you used to be slaves to sin. Well, really, they've slipped back to that, actually. But he's saying, look, you used to be slaves to sin. You know, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. But you have been set free from sin, and you have become slaves to righteousness. Righteousness should be your master, not sin be your master. He says, I am putting this in human terms. I'm putting all this in human terms because you are weak in your natural self. Right? Remember, he's, this section of Romans is addressed to the Gentile Christians. And remember I said yesterday when we were going through Paul's earlier letters, some parts of his letters are very much dealing with a problem of Jewish Christians. Other parts of his letters are very much dealing with a problem of Gentile Christians. And some are dealing with problems common to both. 
both. Sometimes teaching is very much aimed at the Jewish Christians. Sometimes teaching is very much aimed at the Gentile Christians. Sometimes at both. This section is very much aimed at the Gentile Christians. You know, I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. I understand, says Paul. You see, Paul had been brought up in a Gentile city. He'd been brought up in Tarsus. He had seen these pagan temples. He'd seen the problems people have with this type of lifestyle. The lifestyle, particularly in the eastern half of the Roman Empire where he lived, was the Greco-Roman part of the Roman Empire, where they were very much into education and philosophy, very much into sport, very much into sexual permissiveness. Sounds a bit like today, doesn't it? Very similar society to today's society. He understood you are weak in your natural selves. So just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, because that's what happens when you become slaves to sin. It's ever-increasing. It's ever-increasing. You know, you've got to watch it. It's sin is addictive. Things are addictive. Watch it. You used to be slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now, offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. You know, slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. Now, there, there's, there's two aspects to holiness, and we need, need to remember this. In one sense, we're all holy. We're called saints, and saints means holy ones. And when God actually saves us, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, he becomes our Father, and he says, you're mine, come here to me. I've separated you from the others. I've separated you from the unbelievers. You are now one of the believers. You are holy. And basically, holiness to be, means to be separate, to be different. You are now different. You are holy. You are mine. But, he says, I want you to be holy as I am holy. So I want you now to separate yourselves from the ways of the world. I want you to separate yourselves from the sin of the world. I want you to separate from their behavior. I don't want you to separate yourselves from them because they are your mission field. I want you to witness to them. But I want you to become holy as I am holy. We become holy like he is holy by becoming slaves to righteousness, wanting to do the right thing. Now, if we are slaves to righteousness and concentrate on what's right and doing what's right, the temptations to sin start to get less and less. It's simple as that. If we focus on Christ and the good things, we, we don't spend so much time thinking and wanting to do the other things. We don't. That's what it means to be slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. It is, because if you're slaves to sin, it's what you want to do dominates everything else. Slaves to sin means slaves to self. You do what you want to do. Simple as that. And what you want to do mightn't be anything particularly immoral. <clears throat> as I said, some people spend hours and hours and hours a week just watching football. You know, they're slaves to football. They're not thinking about how they could help other people or what they could do for other people. Not thinking about that at all. They're totally slaves to sin, so they're free from the control of righteousness. It doesn't even enter the head. But what they could be doing instead of watching, you know, 28 hours of football a week, what could they do at that time? You know, what could you do? What could you do? What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? What benefit did you reap? What benefit did you reap, you know, from getting drunk several times a week? What benefit did you reap from visiting prostitutes two or three times a week? What benefit did you reap from watching 28 hours of football a week? What benefit did you reap from it? No. And he says, those things result in death. If that is your God, if that's what you're a slave to, you haven't got eternal life. You are, well... You can look forward to death, and that's it. So, think about what benefit did we reap from the wrong we did when we were not Christians. What benefits did I get? None at all, really. My life wasn't particularly bad, but I was always bored. I was always a malcontent. I was always looking for the next pleasure. 
And the pleasures I looked for were not particularly bad. What was on in the cinema? Anybody want a game of pool? When's the next rugby match? When's the next party? When's the next dance? It was going from one pleasurable experience to another pleasurable experience. And that's all I was looking for. And in between times, I was bored. I was bored. I was bored. What benefit did I get from it? Nothing, really. Nothing. Once I became a Christian, I don't think I've ever been bored since then. There's always something to do for the Lord. There's always something to do for other Christians. There's always something to do for the church. And that's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. And what benefit do I reap now from the wrong things we do as Christians? Well, I don't, I don't reap any benefit from them. I don't reap any benefit from those times when I slip up, from those times when I act out of character. And we all act out of character occasionally. Our character is the character of Christ. But occasionally we act out of character. I'm, what benefit do I get from it? None at all. I'm often very sorry, very ashamed, and there's no benefit at all. Absolutely none. But occasionally, you know, you find yourself doing something exceptionally good. Acting out of, you know, gosh, I don't, you know, how, did I, how on earth did I, where on earth did I, how could I have done something as good as that? Well, it's the Holy Spirit inside working through you, enabling you. And, you. and what benefit do you get from that? Well, you grow spiritually, don't you? Having achieved that height once, you know you can achieve it another time. Verse 22, But now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves to God. We are slaves to God. And that's dead right, you know. Paul often, in our translations, at the beginning of his letter, it's often translated that he's a servant of God, a servant of Jesus Christ.